Let's wish a happy 30th birthday to Sonic the Hedgehog. In 1991, Sega's Blue Blur came racing into video games to challenge Nintendo's platform domination, and he has since gone on to be a household name. Like many, this milestone has got me to reminisce about the early years of The Fastest Thing Alive, and how they shaped his current identity. To do that, we have to go all the way back to his humble beginnings, on the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is Sonic the Hedgehog. In it, you play as the eponymous Blue Mammal, as he races through six sets of levels in a midst to defeat the evil Dr. Robotnik. Unlike Super Mario, Sonic is defined by a more contextual control scheme. There is only a single action Sonic can perform. A jump. A platforming staple and his main means of offence against the Doctor's robotic army. Rather than a run button, speed builds as Sonic moves forward on a clear runway, and maintaining that speed is key, not just to completing levels as intended, but doing it quickly. Encouraging this, his world is built out of loop-de-loops, half-pipes and pinball geometry that need you moving at top speed. Another thing that separates him from Super Mario is how health is handled. Whilst Nintendo might have had coins and mushrooms as separate entities, they're combined here as rings. Even a single ring in Sonic's inventory allows him to take a direct hit once, causing the ring to fly out like drop change. But that also applies to every ring in his inventory. Get hit once, and you drop all of them. And the thing is, the more rings you can collect and maintain before the end of a level, the higher your score will be. Not to mention the increased odds of reaching a bonus level. Rings are a fantastic health system, because they make the game a lot more accessible to new players, but add appreciated challenge for more seasoned ones. At the end of each round of levels, you face off against the Mad Doctor in one of his many machines, and defeating him allows you to free a capsule of animals so that nature can return once again. As you've probably noticed, Sonic's world is one of bright colours, arcade patterns and geometric constructs, all in spite of Nintendo's 8-bit palette restrictions. All the while, upbeat music manages to push all five sound channels to create upbeat pop, fitting up this breezy adventure through rolling hills, hidden temples and industrial zones. Compared to his contemporaries, Sonic's quality and attitude is still quite unlike anything else, even in this early outing. This probably isn't the Sonic game you were expecting. Possibly some of you have never seen this game before. That's because it wasn't originally a Sonic the Hedgehog game, at least not quite. This is a clever tweak of an existing game, created by the good people over at romhacking.net. It improves graphics, gameplay, and even sound to be somewhat more in line with Sega's original game, but doesn't remove too much of what was already underneath. It makes what was already an impressive port all the more so. But. What exactly is that existing game that this hack is built on? This is Samari, released in 1994 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. In it, you play as the eponymous Samari the Adventurer, as he races through six sets of levels and admits to defeat the evil Dr. Robotnik. Unlike Super Mario, or actually, I guess he is Super Mario. Yeah. Samari is a strange game for a number of reasons. Not only does it attempt to supplant Nintendo's most popular mascot into his rival's most popular game, but it also attempts to port said Mega Drive game onto the Nintendo Entertainment System. This means that the usual obstacle course of a Mario game is replaced with the loop-de-loops, half-pipes and pinball geometry of a Sonic game. Even Samari himself has the same weight and acceleration as his Hedgehog counterpart. Apart from this change to a composite character, this is for all intents and purposes the original Sonic the Hedgehog, including your fights against Eggman and your goal of returning the world back to a natural order. Like the original Sonic the Hedgehog 1 also, there are only six Chaos Emeralds that you can collect, meaning no Super Sonic, or Super Samari I suppose to unlock. There are a few tweaks, however, that circumvent some elements that couldn't be replicated on the NES. 
The special stages are based on the bounce houses from the Master System version of Sonic 1, instead of the spinning maze of the original Mega Drive release. In some versions of Samari, the spin dash of later Sonic games is also ported over. And despite my enthusiasm, Samari is not a perfect game by any means. Without the hack I mentioned earlier, the game has slippery, unresponsive controls, and is filled with graphical glitches. In fact, if it wasn't for its strange premise, Samari would be best known for how poor it is compared to its contemporaries. Visually too, it's not quite as vibrant nor detailed as anything the Mega Drive could achieve. But that's the thing. When taken into context, it is quite a feat that a game that required blast processing to achieve its look and gameplay has been replicated on a console that, by 1994, was long in the tooth. It's an underappreciated achievement, especially when you consider that the developers of Samari had zero involvement with the creation of the original Sonic the Hedgehog. Samari is a known unknown. If you've ever played a pirated console with 50 plus games installed, or you've delved into the internet archive of available ROMs, it's likely that you'll have come across this curious mashup of Super Mario and Sonic the Hedgehog. However, it's unlikely you asked where it came from. Samari is perhaps the best known game to come out of the pirated video game scene of the early 90s, alongside Kart Fighter, a mashup of Street Fighter and Super Mario that was also made for the NES. The people responsible for both games were Hummer Team. Named after their founder and lead composer, Homer Sheng, the studio would carve a niche redeveloping what were at the time cutting-edge 16-bit games for the humble NES. Sonic the Hedgehog and Street Fighter were some of the biggest games of their day. And the NES still had an enormous foothold, even with the rising popularity of the Mega Drive and the Super NES. It made perfect business sense to redevelop these titles for aging but readily available hardware, especially since the original developers had no interest in doing so. It just didn't make much legal sense, hence why these games were only ever made available through pirated means. However, Hummer's intent wasn't to compete with the traditional home market, but rather serve a growing market in their home territories. In the late 80s, as video game consoles were dominating the larger territories, China and Russia were having their own gaming renaissance. The high price of importing consoles into these regions made games unavailable to the average consumer. So instead, savvy opportunists developed clone versions of these hardwares and softwares for sale in their territories. This was especially prevalent in China, where more relaxed intellectual property control allowed these pirated goods to thrive. However, writing them off as mere imitation wouldn't be given due credit. After all, this hardware had to be redeveloped from scratch, with only the final products as reference. One of these consoles was the Dendi, a clone of the Nintendo Famicom that saw enormous success in Russia. The Dendi was developed in Taiwan, the same country that Hummer Team was also based. Very little about the development of either the Dendi nor Samari has been easy to find, and a lot of this has been down to the lack of preservation done regarding Taiwan's video game history. It's a shame that only in recent years has the Taiwanese game scene been given the recognition it deserves, due in part to games like Detention and Devotion, the horror game that was removed from digital storefronts due to a controversial easter egg referencing the then General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. But there's more games out there that this country has been responsible for, and their game scene started all the way back in these early days. Homer has been written off as just another pirate games developer, but they had creative spirit beyond their ability to redevelop the work of others. Their first game, in fact, was an original RPG based on lesser-known Chinese history, but it's hard to deny that the most expressive and technically proficient works were when they were playing with a known quantity. Games like Earthworm Jim and Aladdin, originally thought to only be possible with the Mega Drive's graphical prowess, were reworked onto the NES with very little of their identity lost. Multi-button fighting games like Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat 2 were also brought over somewhat intact. Even Donkey Kong Country's cutting-edge pre-rendered graphics could work on less powerful hardware. 
This isn't to mention their translation of the biggest movie of the 90s into a side scroll and beat em up. Although these aren't as polished as titles developed in Japan or the United States, they also came from aspiring programmers and artists who didn't have the opportunities that these gaming capitals had. Instead, they had to figure these things out themselves. It's experimentation and business opportunity that led to weird, but admirable works, like Samari. Homer Team were one of the first people out there making Sonic games beyond Sega's vision, pioneering what would blossom into a vibrant community of hackers and game makers who would take Sonic the Hedgehog in new directions. A community that not only exists today, but have even gotten the blessing of Sega themselves. After all, Sonic Mania wouldn't have existed if not for fan projects like the Retro Engine, which attempted to port the Mega Drive Sonic games to modern platforms without compromises. The Retro Engine even became the backbone of the celebrated iPhone ports of Sonic CD 1 and 2. Outside of that, people have also been able to port Sonic's mechanics into the Doom Engine, and even new 3D engines like Unity, all without the help of Sonic's original developers. Granted, many of these have come about due to a love for the IP, rather than to turn a quick book. While Samari the Adventurer may not have seen more adventures beyond his first game, it's undeniable that for many people out there, he was their first taste of what Mega Drive and Genesis owners could enjoy in their home territories. For the early years of Sonic the Hedgehog, developing his identity over the course of five mainline games and countless spin-offs, this was an early example of him setting trends. After all, who'd go to the effort of remaking his game for the NES if there wasn't an audience eager for it? As tariffs have relaxed and gaming has come to China and Russia in a more recognisable fashion, the rich history that Hummer Team created is unfortunately doomed to be forgotten. Fortunately, the existence of those 101 game carts and ROM depots means that their work will exist for some time and hopefully we'll get some further appreciation beyond this video. Although the Hedgehog might have had the most important birthday this year, I'd like to wish a happy birthday to this weird love child of Mario and Sonic. He was, for many gamers outside of the US and Japan, their first glimpse of Sega's mascot. And he would be the first of many projects inspired by the blur that would kickstart the age of Sonic's brilliant fan game community. I've been James and I'll see you all in the next upload.